Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox largely recognized the first seven ecumenical councils. These meetings of early Christians helped define much of Christology, who or what is Jesus, and natures concerning the faith and other fundamentals of Christianity. Among these councils was the 5th century Council of Ephesus, met not far from the traditional location of Mary's home. And it met to discuss issues related to the nature and deity and humanity of Jesus. Shortly after this meeting, a document was written by Cyril of Alexandria, one of the primary figures in that council. His document on the unity of Christ is the subject of this recording. And it is this document which contains mysteries still relevant to all Christians across denominational spheres to this day. In On the Unity of Christ, the great struggle is presented between the correct orthodox teaching, which had been passed on by the faith and handed on is the terminology given, literally tradition, and the antagonistic new heresy introduced by, to quote the translation I was reading from, the new seen dragon, or the recently witnessed dragon, whose poisonous teaching is leading to the degradation of the church. This figure, of course, whom the author Cyril is alluding to, is Nestorius, for whom and against whom the council was invoked. Nestorius was the patriarch of Constantinople. He was an Antiochian theologian and deeply versed in the sophisticated language and terms of the time to describe Jesus. However, in a well-publicized sermon, he denied that Mary should be called the Theotokos, or God-bearer, mother of God, but instead Christotokos, meaning the Christ-bearer, mother of Christ. The logic in Nestorius's mind was built upon the fact that Mary contributed only the human nature to the person of Jesus. However, as the Catholic West had pointed out for a long time, mothers don't give birth to natures, they give birth to persons. And the person whom Mary gave birth to was Jesus of Nazareth, truly human, but also truly God. It was argued by antagonistic authors, such as John Cassian, who defended the orthodox position, that if you take Nestorian's arguments to his logical extent, you don't end up with uh, a Christ with two natures, but instead a kind of schizophrenic uh, two-person entity. Whether this is authentic or not remains besides the point. This doctrine, denying Theotokos as a title, led Cyril, the patriarch of Alexandria, Egypt, one of the foremost sees of the empire, to vehemently defend the orthodox position concerning Jesus. And he turned to his ally, then Pope Celestine I, Bishop of Rome, for assistance. While it is true that Nestorianism was condemned at Ephesus and the title Theotokos defended, on the unity of Christ, the document which we are discussing today, swiftly proceeds away from the poisonous teaching of this new seen dragon to the very substance of this faith passed on or handed on, once again to quote the the text, from the apostolic era. And this faith is contained in, in many statements which Cyril takes directly from Scripture. It is interesting to note that Cyril relies heavily on scriptural quotations. Um, Instead of citing uh, apostolic traditions alone or trying to engage in a typological argument alone, although there are elements of this for certain, instead he is trying to build fundamental doctrine, Christological doctrine, on 
well-known passages such as Philippians chapter 2, the kenosis hymn. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not think equality with God something to be seized, grasped that, but instead emptied himself and made himself in the form of a bondservant and being found in human likeness was obedient to death, even the death that one dies on a cross. What's unique about that very early Christological hymn is that it is framed by Cyril in the text as coming from, and I love this, Paul, the priest of the mysteries, or the presbyter of the mysterion. Uh, this idea that the incarnation is itself this vast mystery and is a point of the union of he who is co-equally God in nature, in morphe, according from the Greek there, uh, and yet at the same time is in fullness human. And it was that big mystery that Cyril was trying to capture, as he says, not to downplay Scripture in any way, shape, or form, but to unveil the fullness of the Word of God in its complexity. I've been asked to point out a pastoral question, one which might be helpful towards future ministry. And many people would say, well, isn't this some ancient mumbo-jumbo? Um, isn't this merely a, a debate of the past? We've moved on from these kind of arguments. And yet I would argue that it is Cyril's wrestling with this question, which fundamentally leads us to examine in our preaching and in our teaching, how are we presenting Jesus in a church that is often dominated either with theory on one hand, which could have Jesus uh, somewhat floating above everyone in a kind of distant stained glass mural, or Jesus the social justice warrior, where his humanity is only mentioned, to try to present the full Jesus in his ferociousness, fully God and fully human. It is in presenting the full Jesus, the entirety of Jesus, that is our primary apostolic mission without which we cannot present the good news or gospel. Um, I believe that too often there is, depending on our theological preference, progressive or conservative, a tendency to accent parts of Christ without presenting the total Christ. And I find presenting Jesus as depicted in Scripture to be one of the most, for me, the most rewarding gift of my life. So, I would also fundamentally add, um, even as I'm running out of time here, uh, the fact that Cyril of Alexandria's work, although influential, uh, supposedly led to the Monophysite heresy later on, that he didn't quite distinguish the way in which this union uh, with, of the human and divine natures in Christ was fulfilled or carried out, and that that imprecise language needed to be hammered out by the later Council of Chalcedon and Pope Leo's tome. I would argue it's quite interesting that if we look at the movements of theological discourse, the areas of ambiguity that remain after a council or after a theological debate often give rise to future clarification. The fact that we're still talking about issues of Christology 2,000 years after the earthly ministry of Jesus demonstrates to me the incredible relevancy of these questions. Um, for me, these are fundamental, and they deserve further investigation. God bless.